What's the chariot in Ezekiel 1? What's the chariot? What kind of chariot is it in Ezekiel 1? It's a war chariot. It helps to know that. It's a war chariot. It's a king at the head of an army in a chariot going out to war. Uh, once you know that, all sorts of things in Ezekiel 1 to 3 make sense. Okay? What skill he worked in it, that was for lesson. What does that have to do? Well, it has everything to do with the passage under consideration, which is Numbers 2 and 3, and we will discover that that has everything to do with Joseph. Numbers 2 and 3. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, The people of Israel shall encamp each by his own standard with the ensigns of their father's houses. They shall encamp facing the tent of meeting on every side. Okay. So the front doors to the tents were where? All the front doors were where? <laughs> Facing the sanctuary. What's an ensign? Flag. That's a flag. Yes. Okay. Now, I've seen pictures of the sanctuary with the tents of the people right around it, right up to the edge of the white linen curtains that surrounded the court. Have you seen pictures like that? They're wrong. The temple with its courts and the temple in Ezekiel 40 to 48 were based according to the Talmud on the original uh, plan of the camp of Israel in the wilderness. Now the camp in the wilderness was a war camp. This word for thousands, like so many thousands went out, is the word for a military unit. That's why you can't say that six million people or however many it was came out of Egypt. It tells you how many military units they had. Later on the word came to mean thousands and that's how it got translated into so many thousands. Now look. Okay. According to Ezekiel, God didn't want the people right out against the sanctuary. That isn't how it was. All right. We'll put the sanctuary in here like this. And we'll put the cord around it like this. And then what? And then he had an open space that was about a mile across. Big open space. Big. They weren't near. Where were they? Now see, this isn't drawn on the scale, but you get the idea. We're roughly trying to make a square here. And I suppose if we wanted to do it right, we could do it more like this. Okay? You get the picture? Mm -hmm. Alright, now... What's the primary side in the ancient world? What's north is the prime direction in the modern world? What's the prime direction in the ancient world? East, East of course. The sun rises, light. Mm -hmm. Right? The prime direction is east. I still made north the prime direction because we face north. Mm -hmm. This isn't right, but that's all right. Who's on the east? The east side toward the sunrise shall be the standard of the camp of Judah by their companies, the leader of the people of Judah being Nashon, the son of Amminadab, his host being 74,600. Those to encamp next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar, the leader of the people of Issachar being Nathanael, the son of Zuar, his host numbering 54,400, and the tribe of Zebulun. So, who do we have in the middle? Judah. Judah. And who's next? Now, what shall I do next? North or south? Wait a minute. If you got east this way, yeah. you got to do it right. East, yes. Where should I put you? Should I put you to? First of all, I'm going to say, okay. Okay. Next, I'm going to go to Issachar and Zebulun. Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's next? <laughs> South Reuben. And do you see why I'm going to do this? I'm going to put Reuben in the middle. What's the preeminent position? 
Then Simeon, is that right? And then Pierre? How am I doing? Okay. Right. Antenna meeting in the middle. West, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. Four Ephraim and Manasseh. Is, this is Joseph. And who's Benjamin? And the other son of Rachel. Rachel. This is Rachel. All right. And lastly, Dan Asher and Naphtali. And of course, what stood between the people and God? Levi. The Levitical things. Gershon, Kohath, Morari, and the families of Moses and Aaron. <coughs> Gershon, Kohath, Morari, and on the east, the preeminent side, the priestly families of Moses and Aaron. Would you say that was a fence? What? Would you say that inner pattern? What was this? Yeah. This here? Yeah. This is the Levitical camp. This is the tribe of Levi. Okay. Why are there 13? Because Joseph is? Two tribes. Two tribes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And of all the Levites, the priests are the preeminent ones. So they're over here. Yeah. Judah's symbol is? Mine. 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 And what are the others? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, have you heard of the Mark Chagall windows in the Great Temple in Jerusalem, the Central Temple of Judaism, with, this, with the 12 standards of the 12 tribes? It's something to see. Ezekiel 1. Let's see. Each had the face of a man in front, the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox at the left, the face of an eagle at the back. Okay. Sure enough, those are some of the designations of what was on the standards. Hmm. So the four beasts are the four corner tribes, the cardinal tribes which take preeminence over the other tribes on their side. So the war chariot is God surrounded by his heavenly host. Remember this is the earthly host which is an exact reflection of the heavenly host. Okay, any question about this? Now is that space there so that the people would have some place to gather around? Yes, of course, this is so the worship. Be tripping over each other's tent poles and whatever. Well, you don't want to be in here and worship in your house. Okay. You go in here to worship on the Sabbath in the great national assemblies. And then, two, if it's time to bring a sin offering and you've done something wrong, it's a shame. It's called open confession of sin because what do you do? You have to go out here and the animals are kept outside and get your animal or what? Oh, I'm here. Yeah, if you got this, what does everybody know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's open confession of sin. This is the war camp of Israel.
This is the earthly host, and then there was the heavenly host, of which those four beasts were symbols. You know, in Daniel 8, you get the host of heaven being trampled by the little horn down to the ground. It doesn't make any distinction between the heavenly and the earthly host. Because remember, the ancient mind did not make a distinction between the earthly plane and the heavenly plane. It didn't say that the earthly was a reflection of the heavenly. What did it say? They were the same thing. One endless continuum, okay? You probably said it, but I don't think I heard it. But, so the Levitical priesthood would be uh, uh, oh. go between the two people and, and God. God. Yes. In fact, it even says that. I mean, it's there. Yeah, showing it there. Uh, if you read uh, uh, Numbers 3, it, uh, it tells you specifically that they are to um, be between God and Israel. If you read the chapter, it says it a couple times. Let's see. Gershon is behind the tabernacle to the west. Kohath is on the south side. Merari is on the north side. And the... Um, Priests are on the east. Where is that, John? Uh, numbers, uh, numbers three. And um, beginning at verse 21 and going through verse 39. Does this help? If you miss this, then Ezekiel 1 to 3 is kind of a mystery, huh? I didn't. I must admit, I didn't look at the Sabbath school lesson itself. Did it mention that? No, I didn't look at um, it. That's no. <laughs> it would have helped. I thought the whole treatment of this first lesson was sort of a, a waste of time. I wasn't very impressed with that. That's what I was supposed to do. All right, and, and of course this then continues into Revelation 4 and 5 yeah. with the four beasts and the 24 elders surrounding the heavenly throne because the heavenly throne there is a takeoff on the war chariot in Ezekiel 1 to 3 which is a mingling of a chariot, a war chariot and the Ark of the Covenant and the war camp of Israel. Why? Do prophets ever mingle different traditions and symbols? Mm -hmm. uh, by now you are used to the fact that the Hebrew writers do what? Mm -hmm. They write on multiple levels at once, and what do they expect? Mm -hmm. Expect that you'll figure it out. Look, Ezekiel is part of this worn down, starved, he's almost dead, broken band of, of uh, refugees who have been dragged over there as prisoners of war, wondering what is God, what happened to God, where is God, and what does he see? Where is God? First of all, since he's in his war chair, God is what? Is God still in absolute control? Yes. And was he limited to the temple in Jerusalem? No. He's what? He's there in Babylon, running things. This is news to Ezekiel. Who's running the show in Babylon? God is. Yeah. Another point, another nail, right? When the Babylonians were running things, was that the devil running the show instead of God? Mm. No, nobody runs the show instead of God. Everything that happens, what? Everything that happens, what? Uh, is always God's sovereign will. You know, it's so interesting because as Adventists, we love to quote all things work together for the good, for the love of God, and yet we don't understand that. Um, he asks the question about the dead. Okay, and it's going to have some bearing on on uh, on what we're doing here. What book, literarily, what book does Ezekiel have the most in common with? Words, phrases, structure, terminology. What book in the in the rest of the canon? shares more words in common with Leviticus than any other? Who wishes to hazard an answer? Hmm? What? I think that was Freudian. Ezekiel. Did I say Ezekiel? Yeah. <laughs> well, why Ezekiel? Why is it Ezekiel? Think now. He's Aramite. Well, more than Aaronite, what? He described the temple in the Yeah. 
But Ezekiel was a functioning priest. The only writer in the Old Testament who was a functioning priest. He was a priest when he was taken away. The only prophet who was a functioning priest. It's not surprising that Ezekiel and Leviticus share more in common than any other two books. Okay. All right. Now Ezekiel also comments on the state of the dead in that famous passage. What is it, Ezekiel 32? Now I didn't know we were going to go here. This is an answer to a question. No, that's not it. No, I'm not. This is the one where they're kind of in this uh, underworld where they they can't influence the uh, the living there. Yes, yes. It's uh, the passage from which uh, Dante draws his picture of the inferno. Uh, Ezekiel. Well, now we're not really studying Ezekiel. This is an answer to the question about the souls of the animals and the people in Leviticus here. Uh, this is the lament against Egypt, Ezekiel 32, verse 17. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man. Is this our passage? I think so. Uh, Wail over the multitude of Egypt and send them down, her and the daughters of majestic nations, to the netherworld, to those who have gone down to the pit. Whom do you surpass in beauty? Go down and be laid with the uncircumcised. That was appropriate to be said to the Egyptians because they were circumcised. They shall fall amid those who are slain by the sword, and with her shall lie all her multitudes. The mighty chiefs shall speak of them with their helpers out of the midst of Sheol. And what do the chiefs who are living in Sheol say? They're speaking now. These are the dead in Sheol, and they're speaking to each other. Again, listen everyone, the dead are talking to each other down in Sheol after death. They have come down. They lie still, the uncircumcised, slain by the sword. Assyria is there and all her company, their graves round about her, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit. You know, Assyria was the great enemy, the really wild, truly vicious nation in, in history. And her company is round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who spread terror in the land of the living. Elam is there and all her multitude about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword, who went down uncircumcised into the netherworld, who spread terror in the land of the living. And they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They have made her a bed among the slain with all her multitude, their graves round about her, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword. For terror of them was spread in the land of the living, and they bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. They are placed among the slain. Meshach and Tubal are there, and all their multitude, their graves round about them, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, for they spread terror in the land of the living. And they do not lie with the fallen mighty men of old who went down to Sheol with their weapons of war, whose swords were laid under their heads and whose shields are on their bones. For the terror of the mighty men was in the land of the living. So you shall be broken and lie among the uncircumcised with those who were slain by the sword. By the way, we have had burials uncovered exactly like this with the warriors with the sword under the skull. This is describing the actual burial. Edom is there and her kings and her princes who all their might are laid with those who are slain by the sword, they lie with the uncircumcised, with those who go down to the pent. The princes of the north are there, all of them, and all the Sidonians who have gone down in shame, with all the slain for all the terror which they caused by their might. They lie uncircumcised with those who are slain by the sword and bear their shame with those who go down to the pit. When Pharaoh sees them, he will comfort himself for all his multitude and all his army slain by the sword, says the Lord God. For he spread terror in the land of the living, therefore he should be laid among the uncircumcised, with those who are slain by the sword, Pharaoh and all his multitude. What does it say that Pharaoh will do when he goes down to the pit? What will he feel? He'll be comforted. Why? <laughs> and even though these people are the uncircumcised, Pharaoh will be happy. Why? Would he feel that he was in bad company or good company? Good company. Yeah. Yeah, and, the, and the, the princes are surprised when they see Egypt come down, aren't they? 
and they say, you're coming down too. But Pharaoh will take comfort when he sees that all those, those mighty nations are down there already with him. Um, well, the, uh, what happened to, uh, to uh, Rachel when she died? Genesis 35. What what happened there? Verse eighteen. What happened? Now this was not in the evangelistic series that you went to. This verse was not flashed on the screen. Her soul was going on. What, what, what exactly was it? Do you have an interlinear? Yeah. What was it that was leaving? Uh, it's uh, Nefesh. Yes, her Nefesh was on its way out of her. It says her. her Nefesh was going out of her. Uh, Jeremiah 15 and verse 9. Jeremiah 15 and verse 9. And all we're doing by looking at texts that are so widely separated in time and theology is to show you that this was a general conception. This, this is the passage that says that not even Moses or Samuel could save the land. We begin in verse 8. I have made their widows more in number than the sand of the sea. I have brought against the mothers of young men, a destroyer at noonday. I have made anguish and terror <coughs> fall on them suddenly. She has, she who bore seven has languished. Her nephesh has gone away. Her son went down while it was yet day, and she has been shamed and disgraced. Hmm. So what was happening to her? Psalm 16, one of the famous passages, Psalm 16. Psalm 16. You know what this uh, psalm is, I suppose. In verse uh, 9, 16, 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure, for thou dost not give me up to Sheol, or let the godly one see the pit. Where does one go at death? Huh? Where does one go? To the grave or hell? To Sheol. I don't want you to say the grave because it doesn't mean the grave. I don't want you to say hell because that's loaded with connotations that the Bible doesn't have. Hell is a Greek word, a Greek concept, utterly foreign to what we're talking about here. Where does one go when one dies? You say it. Don't let anybody else let him say it. Where does one go? No. Not the grave. No, this is not the grave. <laughs> Help him, somebody. Where the is underworld. Sheol, the underworld. Sheol, the underworld of the Old Testament. Sheol, say Sheol. Sheol. This is the underworld. It's not the grave. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever told you the grave? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, but but I'm trying to take away okay. what's exegesis. Yep. Getting out of the text what it holds. What? <clears throat> Without reading into it what you think it says because of religious tradition. How many people were in Sheol in, in Ezekiel 32? How many folks are going to be in your grave or my grave? One. How many in Ezekiel 32 were in Sheol? Together. Multitudes. And, and were they face to face with each other? Yes. Yes, they were. In fact, the Assyrians were surprised when they saw what? The Egyptians. The Assyrians didn't expect what? Who were, in, the, in the 8th century, who were the two great powers fighting for control of the world back and forth across the Fertile Crescent like this? Who was fighting? Egypt and Assyria. And the Assyrians lost and were destroyed by the means of Babylonians. But here they are in the underworld, and what are they? They're surprised, and also a little happy, we see, to find who's coming. Buddy. And the Egyptians thought of themselves as superior because they were the circumcised and these nations were what? The uncircumcised. Ezekiel says what? 
you're going going down to Sheol to be with the uncircumcised. In the Hebrew mind, where were the dead? In Sheol. Is that everybody? Oh yeah, sure it is. Does anybody have headings in their Bibles? No? Ezekiel 25 to 32 is prophecies against the surrounding nations. Okay? Chapters 25 to 32 are prophecies against the surrounding nations. Now if we go to chapter 33, we have a section that begins about the restoration of the kingdom. Okay? And that restoration section goes over to chapter 39 with the final war. And then chapter 40 begins the restored temple. And it's very much like the original description of the temple uh, or the sanctuary in Exodus. So here's how it goes. Ezekiel 1 to 24 is prophecies against Judah before its destruction. Okay. 1 to 24 is all about the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. In chapter 25, he begins the surrounding nations. In uh, chapter 36, he begins the final war. And in chapter 40, the restoration of the temple. Now then, where is Ezekiel when he's writing uh, in these first 24 chapters? Physically, where is he? In Babylon. He's at Tel Aviv. The, not the city in Israel. That's named after this Tel Aviv where Ezekiel lived. The place where the Jewish settlement was. Now, after a, a year or two, the elders were coming to Ezekiel accepting that he was a prophet. Why? They liked what he said. What he said was God was with them, not with the people where? No. Think about it now. When all the prior prophets had said there would be a remnant that would be saved. Now these folks had been taken to Babylon and the other people who were left behind, what were their prophets telling them? What were the prophets in Jerusalem telling them? What? Those, yeah, the, those of us who are left behind, we're the remnant, and those who were taken off, they were the bad folks that God took away in punishment. That's what the Judeans had been saying about the northern kingdom of Israel for about a century. Were they right? Yeah, well, the northern kingdom had been taken away because of its wickedness, right? So you get the logic. If you're taken away in captivity, it's because you're evil. Therefore, the folks in Babylon who are captive are bad. That's what the national prophets in Jerusalem were telling them. Now Ezekiel was saying, no, God is over here with us. He's not over there with them. Okay. So the first 24 chapters are all directed by Ezekiel against Jerusalem and Judah back there. Saying, you're not the remnant. You're not saved. What's going to happen to them over there? They are going to be destroyed. Hardly even a remnant of them is going to be saved. Right? Now remember, the national theology said the temple would stand forever. Do you remember that? That the temple would stand forever? Jeremiah chapter ten, uh, 7. Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Stand in the gate of Yahweh's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of Yahweh, all you men of Judah who enter these gates to worship Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings 
and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. For truly, if you amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute justice with one another, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will let you dwell in this place, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. This is wonderful about the nature of prophecy. Is prophecy conditional or unconditional? What does the dispensationalist say? Listen to Pat Robertson on the 700 Club. Listen to the Baptist minister. Listen to the uh, Disciples of Christ minister. Right? What will they tell you about prophecy? Prophecy is by nature what? Unconditional. If it hasn't been fulfilled yet, then what? It will be fulfilled in the future during the last seven years, during the tribulation, the end time. That's what they assume. What does this passage say? Jeremiah is saying, if you do certain things, what? I'll let you stay here where I promised you would be forever. What's that say about prophecy? It's got conditions. Now the conditions weren't that terrible. What were they? Social policy first. Don't oppress the widows, the fatherless. Don't, don't carry out judicial murders. Don't murder the innocent. And the, what was the last condition here? Jeremiah chapter 7, we're in the so-called temple sermon. The temple sermon in Jeremiah 7. What does that have to do? Well, the passage we're today is Ezekiel's temple prophecy. What was the last of these uh, conditions? Verse 6. Yes, yes. And if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will let you dwell here. Paganism was forbidden. The actual carrying out of pagan rituals was forbidden. Now, how did the ancient cultures dis uh, conceive of the universe being run? How was it run? We say the pagans worshipped how many gods? Hmm? Lots. <laughs> there were local gods, there were little gods, and there were big gods. Where were the big gods? Let's get the picture again. Where were the big gods? Hmm? Where were they? On the cosmic mountain. Exactly. In session, in council. The high gods sat in the center. Right? El. Remember? The Father God. He sat in the center on his cherubim throne and he was surrounded by his heavenly court of other gods who had responsibility for various parts of the cosmos. Right? Okay? Now then, they had turned the temple into that situation. Where was Yahweh? He was still in the inner shrine of the temple and the other courts had become what? They had become chapels, these side rooms around the, around the courts had become chapels to all these other gods. So that when you went to the temple, were you still worshipping Yahweh? Oh yes, Yahweh is what? He's the high God and what else? And we're worshipping all these other he others in the heavenly court too. Okay. Now, there was a reason for that. And the reason was that theologically they had said, Yahweh being the high God is too busy right now to be concerned with the world. It says in this passage that we're going to read in Ezekiel that they had said, Yahweh isn't here anymore. He's not interested in the world anymore. He doesn't see because what? He's withdrawn. And since he's withdrawn, what did that leave them with? That left them to worship the other gods. Do you follow the logic? If Yahweh is withdrawn, then let's worship the other members of the heavenly court. All right. 
some of these gods were drawn from Mesopotamia, like Tammuz, the dying and rising grain god. See, these gods died and rose again, died and rose again every year. How do you know? Well, you look at nature. During the dry season, I told you about the Canaanite version of this when I told you about the Baal epic. But now in the Mesopotamian form, Dumuzi, this ancient king who had become divine, Tammuz, died when the dry season came. And then, of course, when the rains came, what happened? He was resurrected. So the death and resurrection of the god was an annual cycle. All right. Now, at the end of the dry season, of course, at the beginning of the dry season, the people, the women, wept for Tammuz in mourning, hoping to get his fertility back. And at the beginning of the rainy season, they rejoiced at his rising. Okay. So what we he have here is polytheism, and it's polytheism of a particular type. They still worshipped a highest god. And they were saying the highest god was still Yahweh, the Lord. What do we call that? The worship of the highest god. That's called henotheism. When Daniel wished to communicate, Daniel was a contemporary of these people. When Daniel wished to communicate with the Babylonians about God's purposes, what did he say? When he said to Nebuchadnezzar, look, this dream, I know where you got this dream. Where, where did he say this dream came from? The most high god, right? And now, was there any argument then between them? Apparently not. Apparently there was not. Okay. So, now, the Lord withdraws from the temple in these chapters that we're studying, in chapters 8 to 11. Okay. 1 to 24 is prophecies against Judah and Jerusalem. Okay. You can put this down if you've got a pencil. 25 to 32 is prophecies against the nations. It would be very interesting to see what he has to say about the surrounding nations. Uh, 33 to 39 is the restoration, the final battle. And 40 to 48 is the restored temple. Say, Tom, if you were a dispensationalist, what would you think was going to happen to the temple in Jerusalem if you were Pat Robertson? In Ezekiel 40 to 48, it says at the end of the world it's going to be standing, so what would you presume? That the Jews over there are going to rebuild it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, let's... Uh, Let's also talk about this vision of the Lord, because the Lord is here, and he is lifting Ezekiel up and taking him over to Jerusalem. And it's the same image of God that we had in Ezekiel 1 to 3. But we had to talk about so much background of 1 to 3 that we never got to the vision itself. Okay, let's, first of all, let's put this up again. Now I know that a lot of people here recognize this instantly. Everybody should. What is this? What is that? 
You know when I said last night that they probably didn't have the lines exact anyway? But then I got to thinking they had just come from Egypt where they set out, laid out things like this. They probably had it very exact because the Egyptians laid out things exactly. What is this? What is this thing? The camp of Israel, the war camp of Israel. Where is this described? Numbers 2 and 3. Okay, now what were the tribes on the compass points? I think I have it down now. The war camp of Israel. When Israel went into the wilderness, they were set up as a warrior nation. They were set up by military units. Each had a standard that had a symbol that related to his own tribe. The four tribes on the four compass points were the four, four most important tribes. Those of you who haven't seen this before, have you ever seen pictures of the sanctuary where the tents of the people were right around the sanctuary? No, it wasn't that way at all. The sanctuary was holy and it was set in an open square. Now how big was this open square? Well, about a mile across. All right. The sanctuary was in an open square about a mile across. If you were taking a sin offering to the sanctuary, you would walk at least a half a mile from the time you moved out of where the people lived before you got to the sanctuary in any direction. Okay? Now, in between the tribes and the sanctuary lived one of the tribes. You see, because the tribe of Joseph had been divided into Ephraim and Manasseh, so, the, so there were really 13 tribes. What tribe lived between the people and God? What tribe lived here? The Levites, yes. Standing as priests between God and Israel. Now what was the dominant direction in the ancient world? When we look at a map, what is our primary direction? North. Not so in the ancient world. All you need to do is think about it. What was the dominant direction? East, of course. And so the dominant tribe, the most important tribe, was directly to the east on the compass point. What tribe was that? What was the ruling tribe? The Testament of Jacob, Genesis 49. What was the ruling tribe? Judah. Judah, whose symbol was what? Lion. To, to the west, we have the ruling tribe of the northern kingdom, the other main rival tribe to Judah, Ephraim, right? And Ephraim's symbol was what? Ephraim was the ox, the strong tribe, the great large tribe. To the south was Reuben, Reuben unstable as water, Reuben who could, who had no uh, power to act, who lost his primogenitor because he was the firstborn who wasn't able to lead his brothers directly. Reuben who thought a lot but never acted right. Reuben who lost his brother's uh, respect. Reuben was the symbols, was the head of a man. Okay, and of course Dan, the smallest of the tribes, Dan that moved from south to north, Dan who f eventually sided against Israel, Dan the viper, the original was an eagle. Okay. Then, of course, there were symbols for each of the other tribes, which can be derived directly from the Testament of Jacob. When you go to Jerusalem, to the high temple, uh, the great temple in Jerusalem, the center temple of modern Judaism, you can see there the stained glass windows made by Marc Chagall. And in those stained glass windows, there's 12 of these great windows, one of the great uh, pieces of artwork in Israel. And each one of those has a modern symbol or representation of the 12 tribes. And they're set in the proper compass points. So that when you stand in the center of the great temple in Jerusalem and you look to the east, you see the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? Yes. Now, when we see this picture of God in Ezekiel 1, all this strange stuff in Ezekiel 1 isn't strange at all. And it reappears in Ezekiel 8, so that's the passage we're studying. But let's start with chapter 1. 
And we're not going to spend a long time on this, but let's just look at it. Verse 4. This original vision which had occurred a year and a half prior to the vision in chapter 8. We're studying the vision in chapter 8 today, but this is the original vision a year and a half earlier. All right? Now, what does it say? Verse 4. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness round about it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming bronze. Okay, he pictures this storm cloud with the lightning shining out of it and the light space in the center. And in the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the form of men. Each had four faces and each of them four wings. Their legs were straight and the soles of their feet were like the soles of a cast foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under the wings and the four sides they had human hands. This, you do recognize, is a description of the cherubim on the cherubim on the ark. So the first symbolism we have is the symbolism of the old Ark of the Covenant, which by Ezekiel's time didn't exist anymore, had been lost, was no longer in existence. Okay? So the where does this symbolism come from originally? Well, the cherubim throne is very ancient. El, the father of the gods, was pictured as sitting on the cherubim throne already in the Ugaritic myths in the 24th century BC. So here we have the picture of the cherubim, and they had four faces and wings thus, verse 9. Their wings touched one another, just as it is on the ark, and they went everyone straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness, so, as without turning as they went, so that the lion symbol was always on what side? always on the east, the man was always to the south, okay, the eagle was always at the, at the north, and the ox was always on the west. Maintain the perfect symbolism. All right. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wings of another, while two covered their bodies, and each went straight forward, Wherever the spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire. Now I know what that image is, of course, as burning coals of fire, as it is where? Hmm? On the ark. Or, you see the temple, the sanctuary had three, three uh, altars. altars. Thank you. What was the first? No, the first. The brazen altar burnt offering in the outer court. Yes. Then what? In a line now. In a line, the altar of incense. And then annually on the Day of Atonement, what else was an altar? The ark itself was an altar on which an offering was made, on which blood was put. So now we have the imageries of the three altars, the altar burnt offering, the altar of incense, and the ark. Okay, so this is sanctuary imagery here. Now what is striking is that sanctuary imagery, all evidence knows sanctuary imagery, and yet you get to Ezekiel 1 and it's like a puzzle for a lot of people. Like, what is this strange stuff? shouldn't be strange, it should be familiar. Now, uh, in the midst of the living creatures, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches moving to and fro uh, among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Well, I understand this theophany, as it's called, this appearance of God, because the appearance of God in the Bible is always in the midst of what? God appears in what? In storm. What kind of a storm? It 
We have lightning, thunder, hail, earthquake, fire. Yes, all of these images in the Bible of the appearance of God, which, which is here, right? Now, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures. Now, as he goes on, what other image is added beside the image of the ark, the altar burnt offering, the altar of incense, the cherubim? What else is added? The war chariot. Now, who invented the war chariot? No. The Romans. <laughs> the Romans didn't invent anything. They were good at borrowing from other people. I don't know. They did invent clear glass. I'll take that back. The Romans invented clear glass. Up to that glass you couldn't see through. So I suppose clear glass is a nice invention. <laughs> but now you have to wash it because you can see through it. <laughs> the question is who invented the... Who invented the war chariot? You see the Romans would be too late because the, we're, we're here in Ezekiel and we already have a war chariot. The Egyptians, that's the answer, yes. The Egyptian empire was created on the back of a war chariot because the Egyptians developed uh, the use of the chariot and infantry. They would send their men on foot straight forward and then they had the chariots on two sides to do what? While the enemy was fighting the people straight forward, what would happen? The chariotry would weave in first one side and then the other in a circle and what? and cut down the... That's how the Egyptian Empire was created. That was what was about to happen to Israel at the end of the Wadi Tumalat facing the Reed Sea and they knew it too. Because they saw... What did they see in the distance? They saw the dust rising from the oncoming chariots and they knew that it was over. All right. Okay, so now the war chariot, a wheel beside each living creature, one for each of the four living creatures. I know why there's four wheels, because the chariot goes in wh how many directions? All four, yes, it goes this way and then it goes over here and down, right? It always maintains this relationship of keeping the, keeping the compass point tribes on the proper compass point. Yes? I have this uh, thought, the chariot wasn't uh, copied from the chariot that comes from well, culturally it was invented by the Egyptians. But all these cultural images that were in use in ancient times, the Bible makes use of. If God is a warrior, then what? Then we'll see him leading his people in a, in a chariot. Uh, what does it say in Habakkuk? That he rode on the cherubim and he flew to the aid of his people. Yes. All right. And then the open space, the firmament, because you remember the big thing about the ark was the open space where the light of God appeared. And he's very, very, very careful about describing God. He says that there was something that appeared like a body. Why is he so careful about that? To say that it appeared like a body. Because he doesn't want to say what? He doesn't want to say it is a body. He doesn't want you to think that God, because he appears in form, is a creature, right? being very careful about that. Now, that's the background to this, this uh, appearance of God. Now, chapter 8. I knew we could get to the lesson if we rushed. <laughs> Ezekiel 8. Does anybody have any question about what we've said so far? Ezekiel 8. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me. As I said, they liked what Ezekiel said because it was against the people in Jerusalem and in favor of the people in Babylon. Where was God? God was with them there in Babylon. He had come in his chariot to be with them. Right? Uh, yes. Um, if you see a great king heading toward you in his chariot, what's the implication? <laughs> you, you better hope he likes you because if he doesn't, what? <laughs> the 
the remainder of your life is about to be very short. Yes. So of course, whenever the chariot appears, it's an image of judgment. Uh, it's important for you to know that the word judgment is frequently uh, translated atonement in English because what God does when it says he does great acts of judgment it's sometimes translated atonement which does God do? Does God bring judgment or does he bring salvation? Oh well that depends on you. Well justice and mercy are the two qualities in the great controversy that's the question. Can God be just and merciful at the same time? God does one thing. God does one thing and that thing either brings salvation or destruction, right? God carried out one set of events in the Exodus on Egypt, right? He carried out one set of, ev uh, of events and what did those events do? It saved some people and what? Destroyed others, depending on how they related to those events, right? How about this quotation from Ellen White? We haven't quoted Mrs. White yet this morning. Gospel truth hardens when it does not save. Right? So what can the gospel do to you? It can save you or can destroy you. Right? Yes, so the chariot then must be by implication an image of impending judgment or what? If you were Ezekiel and you thought God wasn't with you and you saw him coming, what would you say? Salvation. Look, in Revelation 16 is the plagues and the plagues culminate in the coming of Christ in Revelation 18. That's the final end of the last plague. How come the coming of Christ is a plague? Well, if you're not saved and Christ comes, that's the worst plague. Right? Yeah? All right. The hand of the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, fell on me there. Okay, verse 2. Then I beheld, and lo, a form that had the appearance of a man. The same phrase from chapters 1 and 2 in describing the appearance of God. Below what appeared to be his loins, it was fire. And above his loins, it was like the appearance of brightness, like gleaming bronze. He put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head and the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the entrance to the gate of the inner court that faces north where was the seat of the image the idol to jealousy which provokes the Lord to jealousy and behold the glory of the God of Israel was there like the vision that I saw in the plain now he's referring back to the vision in chapter 1. Okay. Now this is interesting. Gods were localized in the ancient world. You would expect God to be where? God is in his temple. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No, no. Where is God here in Ezekiel? Well, God is coming to his temple. Where has he been? He's been in Babylon, ostensibly a pagan land where he has no authority. But where has he been? He has been in Babylon. This is an important point and it changed Judaism from a a national religion with boundaries to a world religion. God is where? Oh yes he has a temple but that temple doesn't limit him. Where is he? Wherever he chooses to be or needs to be at the moment. Right? Now he said to me Son of man, lift up your eyes now in the direction of the north. So I lifted up my eyes toward the north, and behold, north of the altar gate, in the entrance, was this idol of jealousy. It's a sexual thing, it's a fertility thing. He said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here, to drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see greater abominations. Now abomination is a word used in Leviticus to mean some practice carried out as part of the cult of a pagan religion. That when it says in Leviticus it's an abomination it means it is a thing that is characteristically carried out in a pagan religion which is forbidden to Israel. Okay? 
So it's a technical term. We have to remember Ezekiel is what? What's Ezekiel's background? He is a priest. It's not surprising that much of the terminology comes from Leviticus. He is a priest. And now for the first time, look, he's in exile. He's been in exile for a year and a half in a flat, flat land. And he comes from the hill country. And he's ill. His wife is ill. A lot of the people who have come over there have died because they have been on this forced march and they've been living a terrible life in Babylon. They're prisoners. What would anybody in that condition think about? What would be natural to think about? What would you want to do? You want to go where? Go home. You have to have moved from home to sympathize with him. You have to have moved a far distance to a very different culture to catch this. He wants to go home. And of course he had thought about home and now for the first time he was home. And he was on his own stomping grounds. Uh, Ezekiel was from a priestly family from where? From where? There were priestly families all through Palestine. But where was his family? In Jerusalem itself. He was from the Jerusalem priesthood. So he was home in a very, very specific way. This is where he'd grown up around these courts. In fact, in the vision, he even, what? He even sees some people he knows. Individuals he knows. It's not, it's not a symbolic vision. Okay. Did you catch what I said? He's seeing things exactly as they are. Now, he brought me to the door of the court and when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. Sounds like one of the courthouses in Massachusetts. There was a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, dig in the wall, because this is a plaster. Plaster has come up over the brick or the stone. And I dug into the wall and th there was a door. He said to me, go in and see the vile abominations they're committing here. So I went in and saw, and this is in one of these chapels there, and portrayed on the wall round about were all kinds of creeping things. Now creeping things is the Levitical terminology from Genesis 1 for insects. Now I know which religious culture this is. I know what, what religion these people are following. Creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. Which culture was it that tended to worship animals and insects and half man, half animal, half animal, half insect? What? Well, this is Egypt, yes. Remember there was a pro-Egyptian party? They had... Uh, they never could decide how they were going to get free. Either we'll, we'll cast our lot with the Egyptians and the Egyptians will save us with the, from the Babylonians or we'll cast our lot with the Babylonians and be subservient and then because we're good they'll, they'll let us stay free. All right? Now this is the, certainly the pro-Egyptian party's head religious spot. Uh, it really is hopeless <laughs> to worship an insect, like a dung beetle, right? Because a dung beetle doesn't care at all whether you're worshiping it and isn't going to give you any moral guidance at all, right? And how the Egyptians got to the state of worshiping animals and insects is a long and interesting story. But nevertheless, it was an old and highly developed religion by the time of Ezekiel. So the pro-Egyptian, this would have been their head chapel now. The whole pro-Egyptian party throughout Judah would have, this would be, have been the center of their worship here. All right. Uh, now, verse 11. Before them stood 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. This is the whole Sanhedrin. The whole 70 elders that Moses had set up this is the whole ruling class of the kingdom. So what Ezekiel is saying is, how many were refusing to participate in the pagan rituals? How many said, no, this is an abomination, it's forbidden on pain of death in Leviticus, I'm not going to be involved? 
How many? None. Yes, it says 70. None refused. 70 out of 70 took part in the pagan cult. This is not a good situation. And uh, with Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, standing among them. Now look, this family of Shaphan was the good family. You remember how when Jesus was tried, there was Joseph of Arimathea and there was Nicodemus on the Sanhedrin. Two, two people stood up for him and kept protecting him. And then when he was killed, they went to get his body. In Jeremiah's day, there was one family out of the ruling family. One family that protected Jeremiah from, from being executed again and again. One family out of the whole 70 ruling families. And now what does Ezekiel see? The ruling head of this clan, the ruling man of this family, what is he doing? He's right there with them. It's, it's broken down totally. There isn't anybody left who's willing to stand by the truth. Not one person. Uh, now, the implication is pretty strong. How had things gone in the year and a half since Ezekiel and his uh, family had been exiled? Now, this whole passage is presented as a shock to Ezekiel. It's presented as if he didn't know anything about this. What had happened? It had declined totally in that last year and a half. Hmm? Yes. Each had his censer in his hand and uh, the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark, every man in his room full of pictures? For they say, Yahweh does not see us. For Yahweh has forsaken the land. Ah, there was the key. The belief that God was no longer involved in human history, that he wasn't there anymore, that he wasn't interested, and that he wasn't going to take any action pro or con. Right. No, this is in the temple. These are in the side rooms, the court surrounding the temple. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of Yahweh, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. He said, now this is not, this is not the Egyptian party. What is this? Now where have we switched? Now we're over in the, the Babylonian religion, the weeping for Demuzi. He said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? You will see still greater abominations than these. Now look, these Judean exiles were surrounded by the pagan religion. We read in Daniel how he was faced immediately with the decision whether he was going to be part of the pagan religion or not. They were surrounded with the pagan religion. And for the first time surrounded by it, they had to make a choice about whether they wanted to be part of it. And the exiles were, were drawing in, away from the pagan religion. But when you go back to Judah, what? The people are practicing it. Verse 16, he brought me into the inner court of the house of Yahweh. Behold, at the door of the temple of Yahweh, between the porch and the altar, between the porch and the altar, where atonement was made, were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of Yahweh and their faces toward the east, worshiping the sun toward the east. What time of day was it? Hmm? I know what time of day it was. It's dawn. What's happening? The sun's rising. And that's why, that's why all these religious festivals are going on. It's the time of the morning sacrifice. And the temple is in full use. Right? It's the busiest time of day. The temple is it in full use because it's dawn. And everybody's worshipping and he's seeing how the worship is being carried out. Have you seen this, verse 17, O son of man? Is it too slight a thing for the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here, 
that they also fill the land with violence and provoke me further to anger? Lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore I deal in wrath, my eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear. This is a pronouncement here. This is a pronouncement. What we're following is the standard judgment theme. First what? Uh, some years ago, uh, an Adventist Bible teacher <laughs> on an Adventist college campus said that the idea of an investigative judgment is, a, is an outmoded bad idea. That there isn't, uh, investigative judgment isn't something that you find in the Bible. And a lot in the crowd said, yes, yes, that's nice, that's wonderful. Well, I don't know what Bible they were reading. What, pa what have we been doing so far? Every time he takes Ezekiel around to the various courts of the temple and says, have you seen this? What is that? Are you marking this? What is that? That's the investigation. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did the Lord do? He came not because he needed to know, because God doesn't need to know. That's not the idea of the investigative judgment. And he said to Adam and Eve, what have you done? And he asked them to detail it, right? Now, when the, uh, when the, when the Tower of Babel was built, what did the Lord say? I'll go down and I will do what? I'll investigate. And I'll know, I'll know altogether, he said, what to do. Now, when the guardian deities of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah came and complained to the Lord that they were out of control, he went with the two and he stopped to see Abraham and what did he say? He said, the outcry against these cities is very great. And so what? I'm going to go down and see and investigate and what? And if I decide that what I've been told is fully correct, then what? Then I'm going to destroy them. And then Abraham thought of Lot and the intercession began. Right? These are themes of investigation. What Ezekiel is being asked to do here is to be the witness and see that what God is saying is correct. And then having presented the evidence, what does he say? As a result, I'm going to destroy them. And I have decided that when I carry out my destruction, if they cry to me, what? I won't be there. I won't be there to hear. What, is that, what does that tell you? This is, we have a phrase for this. For Judah, for the people living in Judah, what? This is the announcement in Ezekiel that what was happening for Judah? Here in 594 when the rebellion against Babylon developed, probation for Judah had run out. It was closed. When God says, you can cry to me, but I won't hear, what does that mean? That's how these, this passage in Ezekiel became a symbol for the end of the world. Putting the seal on those who were sorry for sins and destroying everybody else became a symbol that was used in Revelation for the end of the world. That's how it got to be a symbol. Because this is a moment when probation closed for some people. All right? And here's where the seal of God image developed. Verse 9-1. Nine, uh, nine he cried in my ears with a loud voice saying, Draw near, you executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. Six men came in the direction of the upper gate which faces north, every man with his weapon of slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen with a writing case at his side. This is the heavenly scribe. Right? They have all these court officials. This is the heavenly scribe from the heavenly court. And they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now, of course, the bronze altar is where sacrifice is made. Now, the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherubim on which it rested to the threshold of the house. And eventually it goes to the gate and then it goes to... Look. He went from, from the inside to the front door. Then he went to the east gate. And then he went up to the Mount of Olives because the temple in Jerusalem was just a reflection of this... Uh, war camp in the wilderness God left who were spared what was the key who got the mark 
what was the key to get the mark? That's the point of the whole lesson. What was the key to get the seal of God? There was one simple definition. Who got the seal of God? Those who were sighing and groaning for the sins of Israel. Those who were not partaking but were sorry for sin. Who were characteristically repentant. Who weren't blaming God when his judgments fell but who were sorry for the sin, not the result. That's what distinguishes those who will be saved and those who will be lost in the church at the end of time. Thank you.